I will call to order this September meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And Kim, would you start us with the roll call, please? <clears throat> yes, Kathleen Mills. Here. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Here. And Jim Whitlatch. Here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kim. And then um, in section A, we have the consent calendar, which is a number of, of items, um, the minutes claim submitted from last time. We also have some of the smaller sorts of contracts and partnerships that we've all had a chance to look over that we don't um, now these days don't need to vote on them individually. Um, so if there aren't any questions about items in the consent calendar, we'll go ahead and take a motion to approve that. I'll move to improve the consent calendar. Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. I think we have to actually do the roll call vote. Oh, right. The roll call vote. Okay. Kathleen Mills. Uh, aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. Thank you. Okay. All right. Motion carries. And um, then we're going to move up uh, our, our couple of our awards that are listed as being later in the meeting. We're going to move those up for the, so we have a chance to hear from the award recipients. Um, so I think Sarah Owen, you're going to present those for us. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, Sarah Owen, Community Relations Coordinator. Sorry, I've been flying past. Um, so uh, the first award we would like to um, issue today is our Bravo Award. And um, the Bravo Award is a monthly recognition uh, that we do for our outstanding and exceptional volunteers. This month, we wanted to recognize Hayden Klopp, uh, for his continued service to Parks events since last year. Uh, when I reached out to Hayden to let him know about this award, um, I asked him to give a little background on himself and he relocated to Bloomington at the start of last summer in 2020. But really uh, it's evident that he has had no trouble in setting down roots in the community based on his service alone. He has helped with multiple events of ours, uh, starting with pumpkin launch of last year. And then this year he's helped with the Bar uh, Bryan Park Kids Triathlon, the Cascades Creek cleanup and the summer solstice celebration, just to name a few. And he's actually going to be volunteering with us again this Saturday at Bugfest. So Hayden, this is your official reminder that you're volunteering this Saturday. Um, but uh, we wanted to thank him for all the hours he has put in already. And we hope we continue to get to work with him. Um, in addition to volunteering with Parks, he is also serving as a big brother with Big Brothers Big Sisters. He serves as an usher at the Bus Kirk Chumley, and he also volunteers with the Brown County Humane Society um, at Petco on uh, Friday nights. So, I mean, he's really doing all the service in the community. And as I was typing up this staff report for the board minutes, uh, it, it reminded me that on our little uh, cards that we hand out for our volunteer opportunities, it's a quote uh, that says, volunteers don't necessarily have the time, they just have the heart. And I would say that that encapsulates Hayden very well. So we're very proud to recognize him with this month's Bravo, <laughs> Bravo Award, excuse me. <clears throat> and I think we also had a, a slide to that effect too. Kim, do you have that that you could share? Um, we were able to get Hayden his uh, Bravo Award uh, just a few days ago. There he is, yes, and got his photo with it. So we're very grateful to Hayden. And I do believe he's on the call if he wanted to say a couple words himself. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, uh, thanks. That was, <laughs> that was very sweet. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I guess I would just say that the thing that I appreciate about volunteering with the Parks and Rec is, I mean, obviously you guys give me an opportunity to vol volunteer outside, which is something I don't get to do with um, other nonprofits. But I also just feel like it's been my experience that all of the event organizers like genuinely care about the volunteers. And that's just kind of doing like a lot of the small things. Like if we're volunteering outside, they always make sure everyone has water and is feeling fine. And then at the end, um, they're really appreciative for the help. And I don't know, it's just like, it's just all these small things as a volunteer that I appreciate. Well, that's excellent. We really appreciate you, Hayden. That's an unbelievable amount of volunteering for someone who's lived in Bloomington for just over a year. That's putting me to shame. Yes, so congratulations, very well-deserved award.
Yes, thank you, Hayden. Wonderful service on your part. Where did you come from before you were in Bloomington? So I'm initially from Northeast Ohio and I went to college at the University of Cincinnati. Great, great. Well, we hope you stick around for a long time. Yeah, I will thank you, if, Hayden. if I keep getting these kind words. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. All right. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Hayden. Thank you. Are you in the world, yeah, Hayden? Thank you for all your service and for all the, the time, dedication, parks and recreation. What well deserve award? I can Thank only you. just echo that same sentiment. <laughs> Thanks, Hayden. Um, and then the uh, other award that we have to give out today is our Parks Partner Award. Um, this is, oh, thank you. Um, this is to Green Hat Media and by extension, Garrett Portinga, who's pictured on the slide. He is the founder, uh, the owner of Green Hat Media, which was started in 2014. He offers a wide range of photography and videography services. And he was a tremendous help to us last year when due to the restrictions of COVID, we shifted to a virtual programming model um, we utilized Garrett many times over. He helped us develop uh, a branded intro and outro um, that was fun that we would add to all of our virtual program videos. He did editing for us. He has uh, previously done, taken wonderful photographs of the Switchyard Park groundbreaking. And also when we did the grand opening at the pavilion, he took great photos of that. And actually most recently, you'll see his work on uh, the cover of our summer guide where it was that fantastic skateboard shot on the cover. And he took that at Switchyard Skate Park. So we have um, utilized Garrett in many ways, and he was a huge help to us. Um, oh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a two minute long video that we made of our Kid City Summer Camp last year talking about all the safety protocols. I got to work with Garrett on that with editing the footage and um, that was tremendous fun. And then Green Hat Media has also been a multi-year sponsor of our Glow in the Park event, uh, which just happened the other weekend. And um, Garrett always comes to that. Green Hat has been a supporter from the beginning and we're always grateful for that. So we're just very appreciative of Green Hat Media and for their support and collaboration with Parks. And so we wanted to give him that recognition. And while we have not yet gotten his plaque to him, we'll be doing a photo with uh, his plaque in the next day or so. So we wanted to express our appreciation to him and to Green Hat Media. Okay, all right, great. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. I'm sure his services were invaluable as everything shifted to virtual format. So very nice to have, the, have Garrett's help and expertise there. So, all right, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> all right, and... Let's see, then we are going to move into section B for other business. <clears throat> and we'll start with Barb Dunbar to tell us about uh, some masonry repairs at Rose Hill Cemetery. Good afternoon, Barb Dunbar, operations coordinator. Um, this is nice. I don't think I've ever got to go first before on these long agendas. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is just, uh, we staff would like to re recommend approval of this mid-service contract with Baker Stonework to perform repairs and tuck point work to the southeast portion of the perimeter wall at Rose Hill Cemetery. The funding source will just be from the operations general fund and the amount will not exceed $7,750. Um, now this is all just part of an ongoing effort to maintain the structural integrity of the interior and perimeter walls staff. We have been very consistently, very successful in securing annual funds when we go through our budget process for these improvements. It is our intention to continue making these necessary repairs of, um, of tuck point and some other masonry of stone cap repairs to the walls and columns as budgeted funds will allow us. These ongoing repairs are crucial for the preservation of the wall and its future existence, um, and it will allow it to remain as a viable piece of history in the Bloomington community. That's pretty much it. If I can answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Barb. And as you mm -hmm. noted on the report here, we got um, some damage possibly from vandals, and then another bit of damage was when a, when a car ran into. Yeah. Yes. The wall, the wall, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Yeah, just I know just just to make a point of that, I know sometimes we're kind of keeping checks on which things are damaged by vandals and how often that occurs. So um, yes, we I track that down to the detail as best I can. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. All right, great. So do we have any questions for Barb about this item? Otherwise, we can take a motion. Move to approve. A second. Okay. And I guess the the roll call uh, vote for those who approve. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. All right. So that is unanimously approved. Um, thank you, Barb. Thank you very much. And next up, B2 is a contract with Davy Tree Resource Group for site reviews. Erin Hatch. Hello. So I am presenting a uh, contract uh, to conduct site evaluations of already previously identified vacant sites um, as part of a preparation for use of the bicentennial bond for tree planting. Um, this would be with Davy Resource Group, and they will basically review uh, these sites and site conditions, including collecting uh, underground 811 locate request uh, responses, looking at underground utilities such as water, sewer, gas, electric, et cetera, uh, along with other information, so that we can actually have more uh, data in order to understand if these plants or uh, places are truly plantable and narrow down our list when we eventually submit it uh, to be planted. Uh, this would be for a total amount of $11,133.84 and would be funded via the Bicentennial Bond Fund. Okay, all right. Thank you, Erin. Any questions from other board members about this? Okay, all right, looks like we're ready for a motion then. Um, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, all right, and the roll call vote, please. Kathleen, Ken. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, all right, unanimously approved and so then Aaron will stay with us to tell us about a partnership with IU Upland Makers Mobile for the urban forestry education. So I will give you a little bit of background on this. The uh, Indiana University uh, School of Education has a program called the Upland Maker Mobile. And basically it's a mobile like hands-on learning lab. Um, and they reached out uh, to both Barb and myself uh, to try and conduct some educational programming focused on trees in our parks. And so this would be a partnership agreement with the Upland Maker Mobile to host such educational programming. Uh, specifically, we're looking at a project to allow students to place educational signage on some of our trees that they'll use some of our salvaged urban wood waste to create laser printed signs um, to put on these trees that teach about the species, the value of these trees, and other kind of fun facts as well. So uh, I'm looking for approval on this partnership agreement with the Upland Makers Mobile to conduct such programming. Okay. And Erin, I just wasn't, I've not heard of this Maker Mobile program before, so I just wasn't quite clear about, is there a certain age group that this is, would be involved in this or? So the Upland Makers Mobile works with a wide array from kids to adults, uh, but this programming would actually be geared towards about fourth and sixth graders currently. Okay, all right. Sounds pretty cool. All right, great, thank you. Any other questions for Aaron? No, I thought it sounded really cool. Okay. I'll move to approve. Unless. Oh, I'll second. Okay. Okay. All right. And the roll call vote. Ethlane Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. Motion unanimously carried. That's approved. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And um, then next up, we get to hear from Clarence Boone, who I, I don't think we've seen um, 
on our meetings here, maybe since we first met him back a, a few months ago, uh, to talk about the holiday market uh, contract template. Uh, good afternoon. I think I'm having just a little bit of difficulty with my camera. Uh, although, if you can hear me okay, I'll just go ahead and proceed. Yeah, we, we can hear you just fine, Clarence. All right. Um, staff recommends approval of the contract template for local product vendors at 2021 holiday market. Uh, no significant changes have been made to the template and it has been approved by the legal department. And this is an agreement between the participating vendors and the city of Bloomington Parks and Recreation detailing the expectations and policies for both parties. Projected revenue is between 300 to $450 and all actual revenue received from Boots will be deposited into 201-18-186503-43270. Now, as for a little bit of background, uh, the 19th annual holiday market takes place on Saturday, November 27th at City Hall from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And uh, this is in the parking lot and on Showers Plaza. Visitors can shop locally grown farm products and arts and fine crafts created by local artisans while enjoying local entertainment, carolers, photo opportunities, and holiday fair. And this event is one of the area's most beloved traditions and respectfully submitted by Clarence Boone. All right. Okay. Thank you, Clarence. And um, I think just to be clear the market, it, it may need to be entirely um, outdoors if pending COVID situation, or is that the case? That is correct. Uh, at the current time, we, we anticipate it being outside. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, I'm sure that will be, that will be fine. People can bundle up and browse the, the offerings there at the market. So any questions about this contract template from other board members? I don't see any, so we'll go ahead and take a motion on this then. I move to approve. I'll second. Okay, and the vote? Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, all right, that motion is uh, carried. Thank you, Clarence. You're welcome. All right, and then still staying on the holiday market, you have to you have to imagine that it's not eighty five degrees. You have to imagine that it's it's December, <laughs> well November. Uh, Crystal Ritter will uh, come back on to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, Crystal Ritter, Community Events Coordinator. I am here today um, along the lines with Clarence to recommend the approval of the holiday market exhibitor agreement for artists. This is a template agreement for the 2021 holiday market to be held like Clarence already told you on Saturday, November 27th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at City Hall in the parking lot. And like Clarence specified um, at this time, the plan is to move forward with an outdoor market. Um, this agreement is between the participating artist vendors and the city of Bloomington, the Parks and Recreation Department that details the expectations and policies for both parties for them selling their artwork and having a booth space at the event. Revenue um, for holiday market artist booth fees will be deposited into 200-18 dash one eight six five zero zero um and like clarence said i won't give you the whole rundown on the holiday market but it is an annual event and we are very excited um to have it back this year and um we've opened up applications um for artists and we have had a really good application turnout um, for artists that have submitted applications for this year. So we're very excited um, to have the event back this year. And I'm excited to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. All right. Thank you, Crystal. Are there any questions from board members? All right. Don't so see any. Yeah, this is so great, Crystal. Um, just wondering, uh, 
how, how many applications do you have so far? And is, is there any limit for the artists accepted or, or just any artist fulfilling the, the requirements or the expectations can be included? Yeah, so there is um, a limit on the number of artists that we can fit in the actual space that we have. Um, traditionally, um, if we're kind of still working that out, we do know that there is going to be a set limit to the number that we can accept this year, especially if we're all outdoors. Uh -huh. We still anticipate that we should be able to accommodate close to what we've accommodated in the past, which would be, you know, 40 to 50 artists. Um, in terms of the number of, of applications we've received thus far, we've received about 67 applications. Um, okay. And in terms of how artists are selected, we do have a jury that usually consists of about five people. Um, that includes someone from that's a Parks and Recreation staff member, usually someone from the Bloomington Arts Commission. Um, someone who is an artist who did not apply, usually one or two artists who did not apply for the holiday market. And then usually we have one or two customers on that jury as well. And they go through and they review all of the photos submitted, the applications, description of how the art is made. And then they help, um, they score everyone and help make the decision if not we're in a situation where not everyone can get a booth space, so. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. You're welcome. Okay. <clears throat> All right, if there aren't any further questions, then we'll, um, we'll take a motion on, to, on this one. Move to approve. I'll second. Okay, and the roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank that you. unanimously passes. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you. And next um, up, we'll hear from Sean Marler about the service agreement for some electrical work at Switchyard Park. Hi there, everyone. Uh, I apologize in advance if there's any technical difficulties. Uh, staff would like to recommend the approval of a gender, general service agreement for Electric Plus Incorporated for potential uh, electrical services at Switchyard Park. This amount is not to exceed $5,000 in the current year. Uh, the services to be paid out of Switchyard Park General Fund. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, and this is just the standard sort of practice to have these people on that you know or you're on standby and ready to go if, yeah. Yeah, general service agreements are for unaccounted for, unforeseen future work. This locks in labor rates, which essentially acts as a quote, meaning that they can't change their rates just because we need something in a hurry. Okay, all right, that sounds good. Also, Sean, just from what I can see in the video, it looks like you're, you're atop some playground. Are you at the top <laughs> of the playground equipment? Is that what's... No, no, that's that's just the background. Oh, it's just the backdrop. Oh, well, that's a little disappointing. Okay, all right. Uh, do we have any questions about this um, service agreement? Uh, I've just got a quick question: Is Electric Plus a local company, or where is it located? Electric Plus is a local company. They are also the company that did much of the electrical work originally as a subcontractor. Uh, we did electrical. Uh, excuse me, we did a service agreement for them in the past. Uh, since they did a, much of the original work, bringing them in actually saves time, which saves money down the road. Yeah, okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, all right, great. It sounds like we'll take a motion on this one. Move to approve. A second. All right, and the roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. All right. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. 
next we will have John Turnbull to tell us about some um, fencing work to protect the Sherwood Oaks Park tennis courts. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, John Turnbull, uh, the division director of sports. And before you is a rather small contract, $4,685. Um, that would be out of the general obligation bond series C. Um, it's related to the flood event on June 18th. And I must admit, this is another uh, attempt to put a band aid on not a great situation. I do not uh, duly note it. I have some concerns about the long term prospects of two tennis courts down at Sherwood Oaks because of the location and the amount of water that is now funneled there. But um, basically the fencing on the north side was compromised and damaged in this. This would uh, make it look better, however, not match the other side, uh, but it would uh, take care of a, a real aesthetic and the tension wire down below on the fencing. There's a between the asphalt and the, the, the uh, walkway there, but none of the potential bidders or even the, the bidders thought that that would work or that would uh, long-term uh, do the job. But we did get two bidders and one was substantially lower and we've done work with Value Fence. So uh, I, we recommend that we go forward with this work. Okay, all right. And as I understand it too, I mean, with record numbers of people playing tennis now, you don't wanna just give up on existing tennis courts, even if there are occasional rain flood issues. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, okay. All right, any questions for John about this? John, you and you anticipated that my question, at least, which was, are we doing anything to fix the uh, flooding problem, or how often does that happen? And and it sounds like, as you say, it's only a band aid. Is there is there any solution? Uh, understanding that it may that it's currently economically maybe not feasible, but is there any solution to the flooding problem? And I guess the follow-up to that is, is how many times have we had flooding issues prior to June on these courts? Yeah, the second question is a good one. Really, the, this is the first time we've had a major flood event there that damaged the tennis courts. So we could get lucky? I, I, I don't know. Um, this, the first part of your question is probably a million dollar fix. Um, as I've told Paula, if you imagine all the roofs and and maybe a school roof or an ice arena roof and all the droplets that hit on there and then they're funneled into one place and then they're funneled into stormwater, which is funneled down to Jackson Creek. It, it's just, you know, we would need, we do have preliminary plans for some remediation of flooding or that, that you know, all this water is being channeled with the asphalt and the parking lots and the trails and so on and so forth. But it would be, yeah, Jim, it would be a very uh, expensive proposition. Okay. Let's keep our fingers crossed that we're lucky. Exactly. Okay, all right, any other questions for John about this? Move we approve. A second. Okay, and the roll call vote? Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion is carried. Thank you, John. Welcome. And then Julie Ramey will tell us about contract with Monster Digital for um, some website design that kind of goes beyond what the standard city template can do with website design. Julie's having a, a moment of technical difficulty, but here she comes. Okay. So, I mean, on video. Okay, there you are. Hi, everybody. 
Julie Ramey. I'm the Community Relations Manager for the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department. And I am bringing to you today and request for approval of a contract with Monster Digital Marketing. Switchyard Park is a 65 acre park. Of course, it's our newest city park. It opened in November of 2019. And the scope of facilities and amenities at the park is second to none within our parks and recreation system. Switchyard Park, of course, includes the sport courts, the skate park, community gardens, the pavilion building, the bosque, the um, play, a huge playground, and uh, rental facilities, rental areas, including the main stage, as well as two dog parks, a small dog park and a large dog park. And we are in need of a website that reflects that scope and a website that is functional, professional, and helps us generate revenue for our rental facilities and also serves not only as a source of information for people inside and outside of Bloomington, but also it serves as a channel for feedback from park users and people within the, uh, the region even who want to give us feedback about the park. Monster Digital Marketing is the same company that we contracted with a few years ago to create a professional, functional, business-oriented website for the Twin Lakes Recreation Center. The TLRC has, saw, has seen a uh, big increase in its online presence through the work of Monster Digital Marketing, and we're using that as a basis for Switchyard Park. The total amount of the contract is for $7,900, and it is coming out of community relations, non-reverting, and this type of work is budgeted for for the upcoming year. Um, we're really excited about some key features that will be included in the Switchyard Park website, including virtual tours, social media integration, and integrated mapping. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the Switchyard Park website development contract. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, I think my question is just, um, I understand Monster Digital would, would do the design and then if there are any issues going forward with site functionality or anything, is, is, that, is Monster Digital also available to, you know, if something else comes up or there's a problem with the site, does, it, does the contract cover that as well or are they just the design part? The contract covers ongoing maintenance up to two hours per month as well as it helps us do updates from a seasonal standpoint, things like that. If something is more complicated, if they need to do a deep dive, then there is a certain fee that's identified in the contract that we would pay if something should go up and above, out, above and beyond rather, two hours per month. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Are um, there any other questions for Julie? Julie, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I uh, have no problem with Monster uh, or the price. I don't. I don't know them, and the, but the price is fine, and it sounds like we've had a good experience with them in the past. I guess my question involves more um, what our process is internally as the Parks Department in maintaining our websites. Do we have? Uh, do we have other third-party vendors that do this? Is there any advantage to having? If we're going to use a vendor to have them do all of our uh, websites, I know we do some through the city, and I'm not expecting answers to all these today, but just things to think about. And um, and how does what Monster does? How does it integrate integrate with what we already have uh, through the Parks Department websites or through the City of Bloomington? So uh, that's kind of my general question: is more of a global approach to uh the website uh installation and things like that so that's that's my question and, it, and again it may not be able to be answered today the city of bloomington website content management system was designed by our own internal city of bloomington it department and they created the website spent un, you know an untold number of hours putting together a government website a government website that um, is functional for the public works department, the street department, economic and sustainable development department, community and family resources, hand, uh, police, fire. So you get the idea that uh, developing a website that has a universal approach for every single department in the city is what we work with right now. So the 
system that Parks and Recreation uses is I'm the web content update person and every season and periodically go into our website, work on updates, publish programs and events to the website, take them off the website, put up news releases, things like that. When we were looking at our, especially our business-based facilities, Cascades Golf Course, for example, Twin Lakes Recreation Center, and now Switchard Park, the content management system for the City of Bloomington government website lacks some of the functionality that we would like from a parks department. So we want people to be able to see images. It's, we want our website to be really image heavy. That's how people make decisions about what facilities are going to rent or where they're going to visit, where they're going to have a gym membership. They want to see what they're walking into. They want to see where they're going to take their kids. Our current content management system that allows for one photo per page. So that was part of the reason for moving forward with this third party. Um, we have used our website as an ongoing way to collect feedback from people. And we have gotten in the past year since Switchard Park has been open, a lot of feedback from people who um, are looking for different types of information, who want to see a virtual tour of our pavilion so they can um, you know, think about it for a corporate dinner or a wedding reception, something like that. So that just that we weren't able to mesh the existing content management system with a the, the model that we're looking for for the TLRC and Switchard Park. So that's why we've gone to this third party look. The sites do not twinlakesrecreation.com. And uh, we've already purchased or we moved ahead with purchasing uh, switchardpark.com aren't going to look anything like the city of Bloomington government website. Rather, it's going to look like the website of a $34 million park that is a regional draw, a destination park that people will want to visit. But if I go to the city of Bloomington website and I look up Switch Regard Park, I'm going to be linked to this, this website? Correct. Right. And do we have any other, are any other of our parks uh, have websites that were done by third party vendors or or, or is this the only third-party vendor we've used? The only third-party vendor that we've used is Monster Digital Marketing, and the only other website not housed in the city's content manager is Twin Lakes Recreation Center or TwinLakesRecreation.com. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Any uh, other questions for Julie? Move we approve. Okay. I'll second. All right, and the roll call vote, please, Kim. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Okay. And James Whitlatch. Aye. All right, um, motion is unanimously carried and um, then, Julie, I believe you're also on to tell the, the sign for the Switchyard Park dedication. Yes, thank you. The Switchyard Park is my theme of the day. We created a, worked with a company out of Indianapolis, RLR Associates, that has done a lot of design types of work for us. They worked with uh, Rundell Ernstberger Associates on the Gateway Project. We were coming up with ideas for the city's Gateway Project. We uh, used RLR Associates to create a new logo for Cascades Golf Course. We worked with them on the logo for Switchard Park. So when it came time to create a dedication element, and if you think of a dedication element, you think of a kind of the bronze plaque look on our parks. But again, we felt that Switchard Park especially merits something different, something besides a bronze plaque on a wall somewhere. So we contracted with RLR uh, about six months ago to come up with a design for a dedication element. And they did, they came up with a, a dedication element that sort of models the industrial look of the park with some core 10 steel, which is a functional element of a lot of the amenities at Switchard Park. They designed an element that sort of is a nod to the railroad industry, the park's history as the railroad, and has room for, for example, all of the mayor administrations that 
were part of making Switchyard Park a reality. The dedication element requires some custom work and RLR Associates helped us identify several different metal fabricators, both in and out of Indiana that could create this element. So we did a request for quotes and we, we received three. We went with the lowest bidder, which is Universal Sign out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Their uh, quote for this project was a little more than half of what the other sign companies quoted and they come with a high endorsement from RLR Associates. RLR has worked with the company before. They speak very highly of their professional and quality work. So we would like you to uh, request rather approval for the contract with Universal Sign to create the Switchyard Park dedication element. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julie. And do we have a timeline yet of, of, I mean, assuming approval of when we expect to be able to have the dedication plaque? We will know a lot more once the contract is signed and they're able to move forward with some of the, the layouts. The, there's an, some engineering components to it. There's, I'm sure you've heard of supply shortages. The metal fabricating industry is not immune. So as soon as we uh, are able to hit go, then we'll get a better idea of what the timeline looks like. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Julie? Move we approve. A second. Okay. And the roll call vote, please, Kim. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Motion unanimously carried. And then John Turnbull is back for we we typically provide a fee waiver for the Parks Foundation golf outing. So that's coming up very soon. He's going to tell us about that. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, this is an October 6th event. You are all welcome to join us for lunch. Uh, lunch is served at 1230. But this is an annual, as you mentioned, uh, requirement for the auditors that we uh, waive the greens fees and the cart fees for this event. It goes mostly to scholarships through the foundation, but also some ongoing uh, administration funds uh, for them. That's really it. Okay. All right. Any questions for John? Now I heard about this at the last cart foundation meeting and it seems like a great uh, thing we should Approve. <laughs> Keep supporting them. Yes, I move. That's an easy one. I move to approve. I'll second. All right. And the roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Motion unanimously carries. And then next um, B11, Tim Street will tell us about an encroachment agreement with Hayden Place Flats. Good evening, Park Commissioners. I'm Tim Street, Operations and Development Division Director with Parks. Good to see you all again. Uh, staff recommends approval of this encroachment, encroachment agreement with Hayden Flats. Um, if you are unaware, there is a new development uh, that is actually a county development because it is outside city limits on South Rogers Street east of the golf course. Um, there's a neighborhood just south of the golf course there. And on the east side of Rogers Street, there's an old uh, barn and farmstead area um, that is going to be developed into, uh, I can't remember the number of beds offhand. I think it was around 400 beds, uh, apartment complex. Uh, county planning and the developer approached us about creating an encroachment uh, connection um, onto the rail trail. Uh, in this area uh, about where that black circle is on this diagram. Um, so just a little bit south of the Country Club Trailhead, maybe a uh, quarter of a mile, three tenths of a mile. And uh, after going back and forth with the, with the developer and reviewing the city's standard encroachment agreement, um, we agreed and had everything uh, determined. Uh, and at that point, uh, brought it to you for approval. So happy to answer any questions about this trail connection. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tim. Any questions about this encroachment agreement? No, I can move to approve. Okay. Second. 
All right, and the roll call vote, please, Kim. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, all right. Um, motion unanimously approved. And then Tim will stay with us to tell us some more about the accessible fishing pier out at Lake Griffey. Yes, also um, we have a contract um, for the Griffey Loop Trail and Accessible Fishing Pier project uh, that we are recommending appro approval for tonight. Um, I apologize, the word addendum got in there. This is not an addendum. This is an original contract um, with e &B paving. Um, you'll recall this is one of the projects that was authorized in the Bicentennial Bonds several years ago. Um, and it is a project that has had a long life of uh, being talked about within the Parks Department out at Griffey as well. Um, the main purpose is to create uh, a safe walking connection between the north side of Griffey and the south side of Griffey, where there are trails on both sides. Uh, and so if you, yes, thank you, Kim. Um, the, the green area here is going to be the project area. And so what this project will do is it will construct um, more land on the west side of the causeway, which is Headley Road, uh, and will build a separated trail uh, along the road from north to south uh, with a guardrail in between. Um, this is really great for us because it's going to allow us to have pedestrians have access to both the north and south sides of the trail. Um, which will enable looping the trails uh, with some further improvements that we're going to make elsewhere in the trail system. Uh, it will improve safety uh, because we won't be asking people to walk on the road to access the trails. Uh, right now, if you go out to Griffey, you'll see people parking in the parking lot uh, and especially walking north uh, along the road and then down to the trails off to the west. Uh, so it's very unsafe to have people walking on the road. Uh, this project will also create um, an accessible fishing uh, pier. Uh, this is the central area uh, with the, the three T's kind of coming off it. Kim, if you could go to the next slide, this will zoom in on that area. Um, so all along the west side of the causeway, there's going to be new stone retaining walls uh, to build this up. The pathway will be along top of that. And then in this central area uh, will be both steps and a ramp down um, to this fishing area. Um, this is a project that we had the bid come in and we had to, to, had to do a, a number of value engineering changes to um, in order to, to meet our budget. Um, that is just how the bid market has gone these days. Um, things have come in very expensive, but we feel that we were able to uh, value engineer some things while retaining the heart and the core of the project uh, and the functionality that we need to move this forward. Um, so the actual fishing docks that you see on this diagram, the, the three T shapes coming off, will not be a part of this, um, but are something that we can add later. Uh, it will still create that round bump out right there, that large bump out that can be fished from. And Kim, if you go back a slide, you'll notice there's about five other scaled down versions of those. Um, the typical bump out is shown there um, up and down the trail north and south. Um, the central crossing there will have a pedestrian tabletop crossing, um, which is basically a, a speed hump crossing. Uh, that will force people to slow down and recognize pedestrians uh, crossing the road. Uh, it will create a bit of sidewalk heading off to the east as well. And then importantly, uh, to, to make the loop trail connection, uh, we'll build stairs uh, at the south end of Headley Road there. Uh, yep, going up to the left. Uh, that will connect up with a new small trail connection that we will make internally um, to the existing trails up on the hill. Uh, I believe that covers most of it. Um, the, the overall contract amount is $1.835 million. Um, this is funded with a mix of general obligation bond uh, funds uh, that are remaining in our general obligation bonds that were earmarked um, for Griffey and uh, also Bicentennial Series B funds, B, B funds that will flesh out um, the funding for this project. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I, I know the accessible pier has been talked about for some time and and I was just out at Griffey, I think it was Labor Day weekend, my goodness, it was absolutely packed with people, but you're right, lots and lots of people walking on the road and cars coming in in all directions. And yeah, so this seems like a, a, a really important improvement out there. So any questions for, for Tim? 
Yeah, I mean, I would just echo that it's, I think it's super exciting for that um, area and um, it's going to do a lot to change the, the just feeling safer. I think people generally felt safe, but I, but, you know, it's always a little kind of risky when you walked, had to walk north up the road there. So I think it's great and appreciate you all um, making changes, you know, the market is kind of crazy right now with construction. And so glad you're able to get that where we need it to be. I, I can move to approve if others don't have questions. I just have a question besides the docks or piers that you had to cut out, what else had to be cut out just generally? I don't need details, but sure. anything else of significance? Um, well, we had included some items as alternates uh, from the get-go in the project because we weren't sure about, you know, the amount of funding in the market bearing those out. Uh, so at this time, we will not be making improvements across the dam um, along the west side. Um, and then a few of the other value engineering specific changes that we had to make that weren't alternates uh, included removal of some concrete um, north and south of that central area and transitioning to quarter minus instead. Uh, so packed crushed gravel, um, which is still a good accessible surface that will allow us to go back if we need to in the future uh, and put concrete in easily. Uh, we had some parking lot improvements that we pulled out that could be part of a future project. And then um, the piers themselves, um, we did remove those as well. And those could easily um, you know, be a park's internal project down the line that we don't need a general contractor for, that we could go to you know, Easy Dock or another dock provider um, to, to bring in those piers themselves and increase capacity on that fishing dock. But um, it'll be great to see that completed and, and see how people use it. You know, I should mention as well, um, we do anticipate this starting pretty quickly um, this fall. Uh, the contractor's ready to go. We're gonna schedule a pre-construction pending approval and um, it will involve drawing down the lake again. I know that was a bit of an unfortunate thing that we had. We, we had to draw it down for the contractor to, to see and make an assessment to, to bid this project. And then uh, we had a real lack of rain there for a while to fill it up. And then, you know, we got a few good inches of rain in a couple of days earlier last week. Uh, and the lake did fill up, which is great because we're able to open it again, you know, for rec activities and things like that um, for at least most of the month of October. But it, it will need to be drawn down again to complete this project. I have no other questions, and I'll second Ellen's motion to approve. Okay. All right. And I don't know. Uh, we have a comment question we have a raised hand from greg alexander which i'm assuming is related to this this budget item greg if you will unmute yourself please there we go great um thanks yeah my name is greg alexander i'm just worried um this uh 2018 b bond series um it was the bicentennial bonds that was approved by the council um and when it was presented to the council, there's two elements of the B bond. One is the Cascades Trail, and then the other is the Scriffy Loop Trail. And when it was presented to the council, they were explicitly told that, um, that this money would be spent on the dam side of the lake. Uh, it, it says, um, this is a direct quote from the council packet from October 25th or October 24th of 2018. It says, the Griffey Lake Loop Hiking Trail study proposed the construction of a 1500 foot long boardwalk along the causeway. However, the additional cost of one and a half million dollars for that boardwalk construction is not included in the bicentennial bond funding request. And it, it, they underlined is not included. That wasn't my emphasis. That was actually in the, the council packet that that money wasn't to pay for this particular project. And, you know, given that you already spent the, the Cascades Road or the Cascades Trail part of the funding on things that didn't provide the Cascades Trail, it, it really is setting up a, a situation of antagonism with the city council, which um, has actually expressed an interest in seeing parks spend bond money on the things that parks spent, said they would spend the bond money on. So, um, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know, Paula or Tim, do you want to respond to any of those concerns or? 
Um, well, what I can tell you is that this project has been reviewed by our legal department and the controller's office and for how it's uh, being funded. And when the bond, um, bicentennial bond um, were approved, that was um, you know in concept um, to look at the Griffey Loop Trail. And as with most projects, when you get into the weeds and the actual um, project and what's possible and, and what's affordable to do, um, these details then get flushed out this way. But um, what I can say is that this has been, again, reviewed and um, approved and signed off on by our city controller and legal department. And bond council is also aware. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paula. Any other, uh, I guess we, any follow-up questions from board members? We did have a motion to approve. We can go ahead and probably take the roll call vote if there aren't any other comments. Okay, could we have the roll call vote then, please, Kim? Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, the motion is unanimously carried. Thank you, Tim. And then next up, Eric Pearson will tell us about a service agreement with um, HFI for some Banneker Allison jukebox building uh, preventative maintenance on the HVAC system there. Hi there, Eric Pearson, Program Facility Coordinator here at the Banneker Center. Um, staff are recommending an approval of a contract addendum with HFI um, that'll cover an additional $5,000 to our already agreed upon uh, contract with them, uh, both for Banneker and AJB. Specifically, this is um, needed because of a compressor unit that is in need of some repair, um, fairly expensive repair uh, of the gym uh, HVAC unit here at Banneker. So um, that was something that uh, they were able to kind of patch it together about a month ago, uh, but we do have a compressor that, that needs to be replaced. And so that's kind of the, the need to, to come back with this addendum. Um, I feel like we continue to uh, increase these over each year and, and each year that we do our annual agreement with them, we do um, try to make sure we provide enough funds to, to cover things like this. But, um, you know, these things happen with the different units at, the, at both our facility and AJB. So um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I certainly don't want the air conditioning going out in the gym. So any questions for Eric from board members? Otherwise, we can take a motion. Move, we approve. I'll second. All right, and the roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. James Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion is carried. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. And then Aaron Hatch is back to tell us about the service agreement with Bluestone Tree because it is always tree pruning season. Hello again, Erin Hatch, Urban Forester, minus my cats this time. Um, I am presenting and asking for approval on an amendment to an existing agreement with Bluestone Tree to conduct various tree removals and uh, pruning services. Uh, prior, a service agreement was approved with Bluestone Tree, and uh, the amount of funds from that service agreement have basically been used up at this point uh, to remove trees that were needed were needed removal and our in-house crews were unable to do so. So this would be a amendment to increase the existing agreement by $15,000, bringing the total uh, of the agreement to $35,000. Um, and this would be coming from our 399 uh, lines. Okay, all right, and as you note, this is these are Hazard, tr hazardous trees and things are just beyond the scope of what the department can do itself. Yes. So, okay. All right. Any questions for Aaron? Otherwise, we'll take a motion on this. Move to approve. A second. Okay. And the roll call vote, please, Kim. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. 
And James Whitlatch. Aye. All right, motion is carried. All right, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And then into our section C reports, um, speaking of Lake Griffey, uh, we'll have Rebecca Swift to give us the Griffey Lake layer report. Yes, thank, hello, thank you. Rebecca Swift, Natural Resources Coordinator for the city. With us today, we have Leif Wiley from uh, Aquatic Control to give an update on the LAIR treatment. So LAIR stands for Lake and River Enhancement, and this is a grant funded by the Indiana DNR. So without further ado, Leif, if you wanna take it over. Yeah, sure. Um, do you have my uh, PowerPoint or do you want me to open it? Here we go. Kim's got it. Thank you so much, okay. Kim. Awesome. All right. Um, so every year uh, that we uh, that Bloomington Parks has received a uh, grant from the Lair Program for Invasive Species Management within Griffey Lake, um, one of the uh, required components of that grant is that we give an update on those uh, management activities and surveys every year. Uh, um, so the layer program, for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, these are funds received or the state receives from boat registrations. They are administered by the DNR Division of Fish and Wildlife Lake and River Enhancement Program. And they are used for funding control of invasive aquatic plants, sampling um, both before and after treatments, uh, vegetation management plan updates, um, as well as some other uh, projects. Or they're also available for other projects as well, such as uh, dredging or watershed management plans or diagnostic surveys and things like that. Uh, the grant is a is an 80-20 cost share, meaning that the layer program um, covers 80% of the costs um, with a cap of $35,000 that they will contribute to each lake. And the sponsoring organization uh, contributes 20% of, uh, of, the, of the contract value. Um, starting in 2022, uh, all grants are going to be available at an 80-20 cost share. Uh, previously, there was a lower level maintenance grant that only covered 50%. Um, in 2021, there were some budget cuts to the program that resulted in some lakes, including Griffey, uh, not receiving any new grant funds. However, there were um, sufficient funds remaining from 2020 that were able to be renewed. Um, so it's a review of aquatic plant ecology. Um, most aquatic plants are going to occur naturally in lakes, uh, given that they have sufficient sunlight, proper substrate nutrition. Um, and, most, and for the most part, aquatic plants are beneficial to the lake. Uh, they help reduce shoreline erosion, provide habitat for fish and invertebrates, um, provide water quality clarity enhancements, and food for waterfowl and other wildlife. However, there are some species, um, both native and exotics or non-native, that can create nuisance conditions. Oops. Eurasian water milfoil is, the, is the, uh, the primary plant of concern in Griffey Lake. It is an invasive, non-native submerged plant. Um, it, can, it grows, it starts to grow very early in the year, so it kind of gets a, gets a head start on competing for space and sunlight. Uh, before a lot of our native species get up and going. Uh, during its peak growth season, um, in under ideal conditions, this plant can grow up to 13 and a half inches per day. Um, that's basically a three-dimensional growth of both <clears throat> along a main stem, and any lateral shoots, or a radial spread from a, an individual root crown. It spreads primarily through fragmentation, meaning that if, if a plant is broken apart, um, all those new pieces can go float around and develop roots and become rooted and become a new plant somewhere else in the lake. Um, it doesn't really provide any value as a food source to any kind of, any kind of wildlife, um, fish or otherwise. Um, it outcompetes native vegetation uh, very aggressively and it decreases forage space for predatory fish like largemouth bass. 
Um, Griffey Lake has been managing for milfoil since the early 2000s. Uh, they used a uh, biological control of uh, milfoil weevils. Those were largely ineffective um, just because the stocking densities required just couldn't keep up the milfoil growth. And smaller fish like bluegill and uh, uh, fish fry really like to eat them. Uh, Brazilian Eladia was another was another invader in the lake um, that was eradicated in 2006 and 2007. Um, occasionally, it gets some curly leaf pondweed, another exotic plant, uh, but generally that one's a pretty minor occurrence. Eurasian water milfoil has been the primary target since 2009. Um, even with dredging and lowering the lake in 2010. Um, that did help out a lot. No treatments were done for five years. And uh, in 2016, those, those layer funded treatments resumed uh, until current day. Um, early on, this is limited, limited to the use of a granular product until 2019 when we got a, a newer, uh, more effective and safer herbicide to, to use. And that was Percelicor, um, which to date has reduced our overall herbicide applications by 99.7% as a function of the weight of active ingredient going into the water. This table uh, just is a, a, a summary of everything that's gone on in the lake. Um, part of the label for Percelicor is that it can only be used two years, two years consecutively. Um, that's just part of a resistance management strategy to make sure that the milfoil aren't can, aren't seeing that chemistry year after year after year. Um, that just a better steward that product and its and its usefulness. So this year we used a, a, a similar product called Renovate 3, which triclopyr is the active ingredient uh, to target 3.5 acres of Eurasian water milfoil. We did two surveys, a spring invasive and a late summer tier two in invasive survey. Our spring survey on April 30th is when we located 3.5 acres of milfoil. Um, this represents an 85% reduction in acreage of that species since 2019. And the uh, DNR permit approved for use of Renovate 3 at, a, at two parts per million um, to be applied within each individual treatment area. And that map shows uh, the, the, the uh, very few and scattered treatment areas that we had within the lake. The largest one was kind of in that shallow area by the boat ramp. And uh, beyond that was just a few very, very small acreage patches um, throughout the, uh, the west side of the lake. Our late summer tier two survey was completed on July 26th. Uh, milfoil was only found at a single sample point out of the 50, so 2% occurrence. Uh, Riddle Niad, which is an exotic that we occasionally find in the lake, usually doesn't cause any problems as it stays at a pretty low density. It's found at two points. Uh, Coontail um, is, is the most common native species, as it commonly is, and was present at 32% of, of, uh, of points. Uh, other species that we found or observed include sago pondweed, slender naiad, um, and Amer American pondweed, water star grass, some algae, and some shoreline emergent plants like water willow, pickerel weed, creeping primrose, cattails, and arrowhead. Um, the lake was uh, at a secchi depth of eight feet, which is, which is just a measure of the clarity of the water, so how deep light's penetrating. Um, that was eight feet, and that was... Uh, quite a bit higher than what we've seen the last few years. So that's, that's good. The, the clarity is improving, which will help those native species be able to continue to, uh, to grow and establish. Uh, recommended future actions. Uh, this is getting into uh, what we're gonna help or hope to apply for for grants in 2022 is a continuation of the, uh, the spring and summer surveys. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, layer biologist Rod Edgel a week ago. Um, 2022, uh, layer is going to have their normal full funding, full budget reinstated. Um, so uh, most likely those surveys and treatments are going to be fully funded at that 80-20% cost share. Um, for the spring invasive, invasive treatment for milfoil, we'll be switching back to Priscilla due to its low um, application 
requirements um, and, uh, and better efficacy. And uh, again, what we've been trying to do is apply that product as early as we can in order to help enhance the selectivity of, of that chemistry. Um, cost per acre will be a little bit, will be lower in 2022 than it was in, 2020, in 2021. And we also anticipate that there will be even less acreage. Um, also with the grants, they're still requiring the public meetings and plan updates, uh, which will receive layer funding. Um, and we've seen all the, uh, the shoreline plantings around the lake. So that's good to, to uh, improve the shoreline stabilization. Um, and hearing uh, all the other projects that are going on around the area right now are good. Um, and just ask that everybody continues to monitor boats entering and leaving the lake, lake and uh, make sure that there's uh, uh, no hitchhikers being, being introduced from one body of water to another. So remaining for this year, and I've talked to Rebecca about this, uh, we have our permit meeting coming up. Uh, that will be on October 20th, and that's uh, with uh, the uh, layer biologist, Rod, and the permit biologist, uh, Lene Paterschiff. Um, and we've been working on the draft aquatic vegetation management plans, which are due November 15th. And then we will submit, and we will help uh, help you guys fill out the uh, grant application, which will be due by January 15th. And uh, we're looking to request about uh, 10, 000, or just shy of $10,500 there to cover the cost of treatment and, uh, and survey. Um, I'll also be filling out the permit application and I'll send that to Steve and Rebecca, uh, probably mid January, and then they can get that signed and sent into the state by February 1st. And then the grant, then the grants will be awarded, and uh, Steve and Rebecca will send out the bid, the bid request in March, and those will be awarded come March, early April, and the and the whole prop, uh, process starts to repeat itself after that every year. Um, that's that's my update for the layer program. Uh, if everybody has any questions, I can take those. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for the update. Sounds like there are some real successes going on out there. So any are there any questions from board other board members? I've got a I've got a question. Do we have any problem? And you didn't mention it, so I'm assuming not, but and maybe it's not, maybe we don't get it here, but purple loose loose strife. Do we have any issue with that in the area? Um purple loose strife is I mean, it's pretty widespread through the state. Um, there's enough naturally occurring biocontrols for it that it usually doesn't become an issue in too many places. I think from time to time we see it around the lake, but we never see it in very dense areas. Um, and it definitely doesn't seem to be, seem to be, to be, to be spreading or being a potential issue. Okay. Second question is, you mentioned the uh, invasive hitchhikers. Uh, are, there, are there signs at the boat launch about making sure your boat's cleaned and not to check for hitchhikers, that type of thing? Uh, I believe there are. Okay. Yes, and I can, I can second that, that yes, we do have signs up. We also, when our boathouse is open, we're, we're definitely trying to educate the general community about the importance of checking not just boats, but your gear um, paddles can just as easily transport some of these hitchhikers. And then so my- Thank you for uh, asking that question so I could reiterate it to everybody. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and my follow-up question, which is not really invasive uh, uh, vegetation, but maybe you can answer this. What do, do we have an issue at Griffey with invasive species and the one I think about is the zebra mussel or any of that type of thing is that and I know that's not the subject of this report but I'm just curious if we have any knowledge about that. No, that's a that's a good question and uh, it's definitely a legitimate concern given your proximity to Lake Monroe um, which is a zebra mussel positive body of water. Um, we have not documented any zebra mussels in Griffey Lake um, during our vegetation sampling. Um, milfoil and coontail both tend to provide very 
um, preferable substrate for those organisms to attach to, and uh, we have not not recovered any. And That's I good. can say that Indiana DNR mm -hmm. also comes out and does survey work, um, sometimes electroshock fishing to, to look at the different fish populations and what might need to be restocked. And they have not come across that, but we do have Asian carp in the lake, which, which are an invasive fish species. So we do encourage people to catch and remove if you know how to identify that specific species. Those are the ones that jump out of the water? Yes, they do put on a show, but they are extreme predators in that lake and yeah so is there and i guess my last question is there any advantage to be uh, to occur from the fact that we are uh lowering or have the ability to lower the lake level uh for any kind of treatment either for things like invasive carp or for uh vegetation does the lowering of the lake level and i know we were you know we had it lowered for a you know, basically empty or close to empty for a long period of time. Does that afford any advantage to trying to deal with these invasive species or not? Yes, it does. Um, so manipulating lake water levels is a, a pretty common um, management strategy, especially throughout the Southeast U.S. Um, for plants like hydrilla that are more of a nuisance down there. Um, but Lowering the lake water levels allows those plants to kind of de to desiccate and uh, maybe freeze during the winter. So their ability to regrow the following year is pretty greatly reduced. That's all the questions I have. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And I'd just like to say that uh, as part of the project, I know that Tim mentioned that we will have to draw it down. Fortunately, we, we won't have to completely empty the lake like they did back in 2010, as, as Leif mentioned, where we did have to completely drain the lake in order to repair the dam. Okay, all right, thank you for that update, Rebecca. And yeah, thank you for the report. That was good information to have. And I think um, then finally moving into our last section, we have uh, introductions for two uh, new-ish parks interns. So I think Sarah Owen will be back to do that. Actually, they will probably, oh, there's Sarah oh. now. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I was you. just I want to say, um, I, I do not do the intros for those two. Oh, sorry. Okay, so they'll introduce themselves. Yes, yes they you. will. And I believe Max is first. Cool. Hello. My name is Max. I'm an intern for the operations divisions for the parks. Um, I'm originally from Colorado. I moved to Indiana like about eight years ago. Um, and I went on my first camping trip the, near the end of my high school year. I got really, that really kind of changed my outlook on nature. And then once I arrived down here in Bloomington, I really just fell in love with the parks department, or not the department, just the parks in general around here. So that made me switch my major to outdoor recreation, parks and human ecology. And then I worked with the vegetation crew this summer. Um, and I just now five-ish weeks ago started my internship to meet my last requirement to graduate with my outdoor rec major. And I've met a lot of cool people here. They've all been super sweet and friendly. They've taught me so much. And I'm just excited to keep on working with the parks and learn and grow with it. Okay. All right. Nice to have you. Uh, nice to meet you, Max. Nice to meet all y'all. All right. And then next is Emily. Gar Emily is next. And I do have to apologize to Emily. I am not... A able to bring her video up, but I am going to ask her to unmute herself. Oh, yeah, sorry. I don't have a face right now. <laughs> um, but um, similar to Max, I am also an outdoor recreation major, and this is uh, the last thing that I'm doing to be able to get my degree. Um, I have been a lifelong Girl Scout uh, before I was even allowed to join. My mom was my sister's Girl Scout troop leader, so I've been going camping my whole life, uh, super passionate about the outdoors. 
Um, I work as a leader, uh, an assistant leader now. I was just promoted with uh, IU Outdoor Adventures. I'm super passionate about just everything outdoors. I recently got my Wilderness First Responder certification. Um, I also myself was able to be a participant in the Leonard Springs Nature Days whenever I was a kid. Uh, so I think it's really cool being able to come full circle and be able to teach at these now and be a group leader. Um, it's just really cool being able to work with this organization and learn more about being a professional in this field. Um, just very, very excited to be a part of this. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Welcome. Welcome to the Parks Department. And then finally, uh, let's see, I don't know if we have any public comments, anything, we have any hands raised or anything in email or on Facebook. I don't have anything in my email, Kathleen. Okay. All right. And we'll give just a second and see if there's anything that shows up on Facebook. And if not, then we will go back to Paula to wrap us up here today. Right. And Julie just texted me nothing on Facebook. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you, all board members, for um, your participation this afternoon. We had a lot, lot of business, as you can tell. We're still moving quite along uh, quickly and uh, transitioning into our fall programs with Frank Southern Ice Arena getting ready to open up in here in the next uh couple of days here. So uh, definitely fall is upon us. Um, I just want to let you know, you'll be getting an email from Kim tomorrow about a special board meeting, finding a date for that. Um, the week of October 12th uh, to hear a tree appeal, removal appeal, and also an encroachment issue along the Beeline Trail that we wanted to get um, in before your regular uh, October Park Board meeting, which that meeting is scheduled for October 19th. So uh, watch your emails and we'll be in touch with all of you. And once again, thank you for your time this afternoon and support. All right. Thank you very much, Paula. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I'll see you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.